the BBC strike is over, they'll pay 16.5%. The petrol drivers settle, but that's secret. If you want to ask a policeman, try the West End. We captured the moon, but what did we do with it? At London Airport, Christmas is fogged off. Good evening. The BBC's strike over pay is over. It ended rapidly tonight after, first, the BBC staff got a 12.5% pay rise awarded by the Central Arbitration Committee, plus another 4% to deal with anomalies. And second, the BBC management reinstated 11 film processors who had been sacked because they'd refused to process film shot by freelance camera crews during a ban on staff overtime. The 125 plus 4% rise is well above the government's present pay guideline. The BBC's Director General, Mr Ian Trothown, had said the government had warned him that anything above 5% would jeopardise any further rise in the television licence. But an arbitration committee's award is allowed under the pay policy, and so is outside sanctions. Mr Trothown said tonight he was delighted that BBC One Television will be back at 3pm tomorrow and BBC Two at 1.30. Geoffrey Archers watched the BBC's troubles today. Just after four o'clock this afternoon, the strike started and BBC personnel, who are members of the ABS, picketed the entrance to Broadcasting House. The BBC's four radio channels were merged into one and listeners heard the news like this. Well, we regret now that because of industrial action, we have to leave our advertised programmes at this junction. From now until further notice, BBC radios one, two, three and four will combine to bring you an all-network radio service on VHF channels and on 1,500 metres long wave. But the strike had begun just as the Central Arbitration Committee was rushing through a recommendation of a 12.5% rise. Such recommendations normally take weeks to prepare. Hurriedly, the parties got together at the government's conciliation service, ACAS, and within an hour it was all over. The union secretary announced the return to work from midnight tonight. Had the strike been necessary? I think it's difficult to answer that. Clearly, we established at the CAC this morning, to Professor Wood's satisfaction and that of his colleagues, that what we've been saying for a long time about BBC rates is correct. Uh, I think the very fact that there was the industrial dispute it was the reason why he was prepared to expedite his consideration of the thing and give us his award today. Yes, to that extent, clearly the strike uh, has had a substantial effect. I don't believe in any way it's coloured his view of the evidence or that was submitted to him. So what does this result mean? Does it mean normal schedules over Christmas? Yes, indeed. I'm very pleased to say it will mean that uh, most, if not all, our programmes will go out as scheduled in the Radio Times. Are you surprised, though, at the Arbitration Committee's decision to offer 12.5%? I'm not surprised. For months we've been t telling uh, everybody that the uh, pay levels in the BBC have been very much lower than those in ITV and uh, uh, other comparable bodies that uh, the CAC has found it uh, appropriate to compare us with. And uh, we put in the evidence, and the evidence um, indicated to us that yes, we were due for quite a considerable award. What has surprised and delighted us is the remarkably quick response that the CAC has found itself able to make. There'll be no ITV programmes in the Yorkshire television area over Christmas. A productivity agreement was reached between the company and the technicians' union leaders yesterday, but today it was rejected by the local union committee in Yorkshire. So the station will stay off the air, and the three programmes it was to provide for the ITV network on Christmas Day and Boxing Day won't be shown. Better news for Christmas motorists, the Esso petrol tanker drivers have called off their overtime ban, which has led to panic buying and long queues at filling stations. BP and Texaco drivers, who'd also imposed an overtime ban, are expected to follow suit. And the threat of a national strike from January the 3rd now looks unlikely. How easy it will be to get petrol over Christmas will, of course, depend on how many garages stay open. The SO management has made a new pay offer to the drivers. It's considerably less than the 40% they were after, but no one's saying exactly how much it is. Our industrial correspondent, Giles Smith, saw the flow of petrol starting to get back to normal. 
Within hours of the new ESSO deal being agreed in all-night talks with the unions, ESSO's big London terminal near London Airport was back in full operation. So far, no one's saying how much the company have improved on their original 11 to 14 percent offer, but it seems to have been enough for the ESSO men to call off their overtime ban. They won't actually be voting on the offer until next Wednesday, and although there were some doubts about how the vote would go, they said they were prepared to stand by their union's instruction to work normally for the time being. As the tankers arrived at hard-pressed filling stations near the terminal this afternoon, there were still long queues of motorists waiting to fill up. Despite warnings that panic buying could only make the situation worse, drivers in London, at any rate, seemed determined they weren't going to be caught short. The drivers employed by the other four companies, BP, Shell, Mobil and Texaco, seem certain to get a similar offer early next week. And there seems no reason why they shouldn't accept it too, so scenes like these should be completely unnecessary by the middle of next week. Giles Smith, News at 10, West London. In Strathclyde, 100 extra police, 30 cars and armed units are out after reports that a white opal had been seen twice in Motherwell. Police throughout Britain have been looking for a white opal with the registration number APU-827S since the new IRA bombings in England. Tonight, one person reported seeing two men walking into a garage for a can of petrol, saying their car had broken down. One of them was said to have an Irish accent, but that now seems to be a cold trail. In many cities, police leave has been cancelled in the search for IRA men, and thousands of extra police are in the high streets watching over Christmas shoppers. As Jeremy Hands found out, the highest concentration of police has been in London's Oxford Street. The police policy is simple. The more blue uniforms there are, the less likely it is that anyone's going to try anything. And apart from the 2,000 uniforms, an undisclosed number of which are concealing arms, there's a large contingent of plain clothes men stopping and questioning shoppers. In addition, the centre of the capital is ringed by police, whose job it is to stop suspects even getting to the West End. All police leave has been cancelled until further notice, and they're all working a 12-hour day. Hundreds of 999 calls have been made from members of the public who've seen suspiciously parked cars or found parcels where they shouldn't be, or just seen someone acting strangely. But despite the fact we're technically going through a terrorist campaign, the festive spirit still keeps breaking through the tension. The most common question the police were asked today was not about bombs or parcels, but directions to tube stations and toilets. But the police will stay out in force, even though it is for the moment, as one constable put it, all quiet on the West End front. Jeremy Hands, News at 10, Central London. America's Secretary of State, Mr Cyrus Vance, has said that the United States and Russia are close to reaching agreement on limiting the nuclear arms race. American officials said they hoped to make a joint declaration with Russia announcing a successful end to the SALT talks, which have lasted six years on and off, tomorrow. Rhodesia says it has again attacked black nationalist guerrilla bases inside Zambia. And it says it's rescued 31 black Rhodesian soldiers and civilians who'd been captured by the guerrillas. Zambia has confirmed there were attacks, but says they weren't on guerrilla camps, but on one of their own army's training camps near Lusaka. If that's true, it would be the first attack on Zambia's own army. There have been no reports of casualties. A pressure group, the Scorpion Society, who help white Rhodesians wanting to come to this country, are planning a test case. If they win, they could open the front door for thousands more Rhodesians to come to Britain. At present, more than 100,000 Rhodesians are thought to be eligible because their parents were born here. Sue Lloyd-Roberts has been looking at the present claim. Mrs. De Silva was born in Rhodesia, and when she came to Britain last year, she applied for a British passport on the grounds that three out of four of her grandparents were born in Britain. But the application has been turned down, a decision now being challenged by the Scorpion Society, who know the claim could affect the future of thousands of Rhodesians, and who are encouraged by the fact that MPs who've written to the Foreign Office on the matter have received conflicting replies. A letter from a minister here at the Foreign Office, Ted Rowlands, in May, said that 150,000 Rhodesians had the right of residence here because their parents or grandparents were born in the United Kingdom. But four months later, another letter from another minister, Evan Lourd, said that only Rhodesians whose parents were born here had that right. Clearly, there's a contradiction here which the Scorpion Society is determined to exploit. Lawyers employed on Mrs. De Silva's behalf by the Scorpion Society are prepared to take this test case to court if necessary. And I asked Mrs. De Silva why she was so determined. Well, three of my grandparents were born in Britain, and I've always felt that I was British. Um, 
I've been brought up to believe that I was a British citizen. Now, if this court case of yours fails and your appeal to the Home Office, what alternatives do you have? I have no alternative but to go back to Rhodesia, which I really don't want to do. I don't want to go back and, and I wouldn't know which side to fight on. Mrs. De Silva and her lawyers are hopeful about the case, which, if won, could embarrass and add new burdens to the government's immigration policy. Sue Lloyd Roberts, news at 10 at the passport office. There's always some bad news around at this time of year. In America, police think that there's been a mass murder of more than 30 people near Chicago. They found eight bodies in a house, and they've detained a 37-year-old man who has a record of sex crimes. In India, five people have been killed and eight injured during more protests against the jailing of the former Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. In New Delhi, rioters burned an effigy of the current Prime Minister, Mr. Desai. And after the break, the close encounter they think are having in Sicily. Dave Sexton's United now fall to lowly Bolton. And if Mummy's kissing Santa Claus, he's probably a computer. That's in a couple of minutes. Strange things have been happening in the skies over Italy. Dozens of people in and around Rome, Milan and Palermo in Sicily have reported seeing unidentified flying objects with a hole in the middle giving off green, red and white lights. John Snow has been looking at these close encounters of a Latin kind. It started on the Adriatic coast. Four Navy officers aboard this light patrol boat well after midnight saw a blazing object rising out of the sea. Men at a nearby radar station saw something too. Ashore, the officers described it. Red with a green tail, 300 yards long. It rose at 45 degrees, flared for five seconds and disappeared. 50 miles down the coast, a fisherman described another object, dome-like, fast. I was physically attracted to it, he said. The sound of the motor of my boat was silenced. I felt weightless. A local photographer snapped the thing and produced this little dish-shaped curiosity. The authorities are still reluctant to describe it as a UFO, but since then a spate of other photographs from all over Italy have been landing on Ministry of Defence desks. This last one snapped by a police officer in Palermo. It's all reached such a pitch that a spoof edition of Italy's leading daily has hit the streets, declaring that the Martians have actually landed. Several apparently sane Italians claim they've seen these invaders. This man says he saw two. 30 inches high, he said, grey, with big lights in their foreheads. What is fact is that thousands have witnessed a flaring object above Palermo. One night near a motorway toll gate, a television camera was able to pick out this static white blob. Too close for a star, too small for a moon, too still for a plane. Local police armed with field glasses have been out to analyse, but to date, no explanation from the authorities. UFOs seem to have displaced terrorism as the talking point here, with new sightings every day. 200 parishioners leaving church in southern Italy even saw one. That this Palermo object rose in the east at a time of gathering good cheer has simply served to confuse things still further. John Snow, News at 10 with Italy's anxious sky watchers. One explanation for that Italian UFO has come from a satellite expert at a laboratory in Slough. He says it's just the planet Venus, which the Americans and Russians are exploring. Venus would have been in its three-quarter phase at the time those pictures were taken. Venus or not, exactly ten years ago, an American Apollo crew set off to capture, for Earth, the Moon as a Christmas present. It was Apollo 8, and for the first time, men went round the far side, the dark side of the moon, and set off years of exploration, and now more years of questioning what that exploration was worth. Our science editor, Peter Fairley, takes a look. The mission plan was simple. Go round the moon ten times and then come home, and the Apollo 8 mission badge told the whole story. The crew, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell and Bill Anders, had spent four years preparing the purposes of the mission were to test the power and accuracy of the Saturn V rocket, test the guidance and control systems of the Apollo Command and Service Module, and search for suitable landing sites for men. 
They reached the moon on Christmas Eve, and Jim Lovell, at least, found the view rather disappointing. Uh, my own impression is that it's a, a vast, lonely, forbidding type existence or expanse of nothing. It looks rather like clouds and clouds of pumice stone. And it certainly would not appear to be a very inviting place to, to live or work. That night, Frank Borman, who was a lay preacher back in Houston, decided they should all read a passage from Genesis chapter 1 as their Christmas message to Earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. Later, NASA reported that one-third of humanity heard that message from space. For the crew of Apollo 8, there were slices of turkey and bite-sized cubes of Christmas pud on Christmas Day. Lovell and Anders had smuggled aboard miniatures of brandy, but Borman, as captain of the ship and a stickler for regulations, confiscated them. It didn't put Jim Lovell off his good humour as the world waited tensely to hear whether the moonship's big engine had fired to send them home, he suddenly reported, please be informed, there is a Santa Claus. Re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere was a worry. Nobody had ever come in at 25,000 miles an hour before. But the splashdown was immaculate, and the big moon reconnaissance was voted a huge success. So where, ten years later, has it all got us? Well, after moon missions, scientists are still unable to say for sure how the moon originated. They only think it was formed about the same time as the Earth, out of the same cloud of gas and dust particles. The packages of instruments set up on the moon's surface have all now been switched off to save the cost of monitoring them. But the four and a half tons of moon rock brought back by the lunar noughts is still being analysed and will continue to be so, according to NASA, for at least 40 years. Generations of students will work on it. Furthermore, there are now official studies going on at Houston aimed at using the moon as a construction base. The moon's soil has been found to be rich in oxygen and silicon, the raw material for glass, and parts of the moon contain useful amounts of aluminium, magnesium, iron and titanium. The hope is now that a mining colony can be established on the moon and use these raw materials to construct large structures in space, things like solar power stations. And at least 60,000 useful inventions are reckoned to have come out of the moon program, several thousand of which have been taken up by industry all over the world. But perhaps the happiest people are the men who first went there. They've all become presidents or vice presidents. Frank Borman is president of Eastern Airlines, one of the biggest airlines in America. Jim Lovell has become president of the Fisk Telephone System Incorporated, making telephones for better communication. And Bill Anders is now general manager and vice president of a company making nuclear products. But let the Apollo 8 crew have the last word. Good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Mankind may have captured the moon, but it hasn't captured Heathrow Airport. Fog brought chaos there as the holiday rush got underway. Only one quarter of the extra flights scheduled for today either landed or took off. All domestic flights from Heathrow were cancelled, and passengers were sent by train or ferry if they were going to Ireland or the Channel Islands. Flights bound for Heathrow were diverted to Manchester. Jeremy Hans saw the chaos at London Airport. Heathrow tonight is at the centre of the big holiday rush that hasn't got off the ground. An estimated 12,000 passengers have had their flights either cancelled or severely delayed, some by more than 24 hours, and it looks like being mid-morning tomorrow at the earliest before the fog even starts to lift. There should have been 800 flights in and out of Heathrow today, in fact only about 200 making it. Taking off presents few problems, but only Tridents and a few other aircraft are capable of landing when visibility is less than 300 yards, as it is now. For most passengers, it was simply a case of trying to grin and bear it. Well, I don't know, probably till tomorrow, maybe till 10.30, but it's no hope. No hope it's then, no you don't hope. think? No. How do you feel about that? 
Well, I'm, you know, really very upset about this because my whole family in Poland is waiting. Hopefully, Obviously, we may spend Christmas Day here, who knows? Brave smiles at the worst possible start to the Christmas holiday, but for the children whose parents were lucky enough to find the nursery, the delays mean an exciting late night and some extra time around the Christmas tree. But unless the fog clears soon, some of them could still be here at this time tomorrow. Jeremy Hands, News at 10, Heathrow. On the lighter side, a trainee clown on a government grant made his debut tonight. He's Paul Holmes, an 18-year-old school leaver who, like many of his age group, found it difficult to get a job. Also, he's only three feet, ten inches tall. So financed by a £20 a week grant from the Manpower Services Commission, he's been learning the tricks at Bellevue Circus in Manchester. Ken Rees went along to see how the government's first officially backed clown got on tonight. It's the first real day at work today for 18-year-old apprentice Paul Holmes. So he's going to hit his new boss with a plank, throw white paint over him and pull down his trousers. But first, he's going to put on a funny nose. Paul is a clown's apprentice taken from the dole queue and given a £20 a week government grant to train at Manchester's Bellevue Circus. He gives his first public performance tonight. But first, a few last-minute instructions from his boss, Clown Jacko. Oh, you're really sloshing me. Yeah, a real good one, you know. Then come round the back, uh, say lay down the handstand, pull through the middle and take me up and then give me the nap again. All right? Yeah. Now, can you do that? Yeah. Right, let's have it. Now make something of it. Yeah. Fetch your hand back. You right? Right, go on, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Right. In six months' time, Paul's grant Paul. runs out, but Jacko's so pleased that he says he'll sure to make Paul a full-time member of the act. He'll be a circus star, able to earn up to £500 a week once fully established. Then the big test, how would that first audience react? Waiting in the wings, Paul admits he's scared. Oh, Paul, this is it. How are you feeling? Nervous. <laughs> you ready to go out and slay him? Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Just like I used to be. <laughs> then it's time to send in the clowns, including the little apprentice they're already calling the clown from the ministry. The audience clearly approved. Ken Reese, News at 10, Bellevue Circus, Manchester. Soccer, Charlie George, the Derby County striker, has finally signed for Southampton. The fee's £400,000, and that at last is official. The deal went through after George agreed to repay £18,000 he'd borrowed from Derby. It was that debt which apparently prompted Derby to call off the transfer yesterday. Southampton's manager, Mr Laurie McMenemy, says George, who's injured, could be fit enough to play for Southampton in two weeks. Dave Sexton, so much criticised as Manchester United's manager, lost another game tonight in the first division. Bolton 3, Manchester United 0. And in the fourth division, Hereford 0, Newport 3. The three other games tonight at Birmingham, West Brom and Port Vale were postponed because of snow and ice. The main points again. Our friends and rivals, the BBC, will be back on the air tomorrow. Their strike is over. The SO petrol drivers have settled their dispute. Good news for motorists in the new year. But gloom at Heathrow Airport. Christmas flights are fogged off. But whatever else is going to be, it's going to be an electronic Christmas. That's for a lot of children in America, anyway. The arrival of silicon chips means that miniaturised computers can be used in all sorts of children's toys. And Norman Rees has been looking at the new marvels for the American child who used to think he had everything. Thank you for turning me on. Let me introduce myself. I am 2XL, a new toy from Mego. But you can call me Brainy because I am the smartest toy robot in the world. There are toys to teach you to spell. Uh, now spell oven. O W. Machines that show how to write music. And there's Merlin, 
who plays noughts and crosses and five other games, as well as any tune you care to program in. And computers no bigger than a pocket calculator that can translate a dozen or so languages. All this, plus literally hundreds of plug-in video games for the home television set, has given the toy industry here a boost in sales of nearly 12%. American parents will spend two and a half billion pounds this year on toys, an average of nearly 50 pounds a child. And while Father Christmas is probably never asked for something that will better the mind, parents here are being told in television commercials that anyone who really cares for their child's future should fill their stockings with a fully-fledged computer. TRS-80 Computer, the most significant investment a parent can make. Programs for your child's education or for business, finance, and home use. Let your children discover tomorrow's technology today. I certainly had a good time working with you. I thank you very much for the opportunity. Please turn me off now. And that's the Christmas news tonight. Good night. What are you